All right. Um, so er is everyone's filtering in. I will get all of the boring stuff out of the way. I am Amanda. I'm a bookseller and events coordinator at Belmont Books. If you're unfamiliar with Belmont Books, we are an independent bookstore in the greater Boston area, right, that, right outside of Cambridge. We're open for browsing. So if you're local and you miss being in a bookstore, we're open. If you're local but are still uncertain about going into stores, we also offer contactless curbside pickup. So you can order your books through us. We will pack them up for you, put them in a little lobby outside under your name, and you can just come and go as you please. If you haven't attended one of our virtual events before, one, thank you for coming. Um, I will just do some brief introductions of our moderator tonight, Lorena, who will then take it over. Um, and then we'll have a night of reading, which will be wonderful. We're not having a Q&A because we wanna give all of the readers plenty of time, but we do have a question for them at the end that they will be answering. The chat function is on, so you're welcome to chat amongst your other attendees or kind of give praise or accolades or thank the readers after they're done. Um, that is all ongoing and we love your engagement so much. So we will start by introducing uh, Lorena, who is our moderator tonight. Thank you so much, Lorena, for coming. Uh, Lorena Hernandez Leonard is a Colombian native living in the Boston area. She's a storyteller, writer, and filmmaker whose award-winning animated short film, Denny's Panic, was Oscar longlisted in 2021. As a storyteller, Lorena has appeared on World Channel's television program, Stories from the Stage, and has performed on Suitcase Stories, a traveling storytelling event created by the International Institute of New England, which features immigrant stories. Lorena is a Pauline Shear Fellow at Grub Street, where she is currently working on a memoir but her experiences growing up during the Colombian drug war and migrating to the United States. She's currently working on it, forthcoming, fingers crossed. Um, it is titled right now, Salsi Puedes. Um, we're so excited to see it. Maybe Lorena, if you have time, you can tell us a little bit more about that. I'm sure we'd all love to hear it. Um, and for now, I'm gonna hand it over to you, Lorena. Thank you so much, Amanda, and welcome everyone to the 10th edition of Tell All, a quarterly reading series dedicated to the art of memoir and personal essay. This series, organized by graduates of Grub Street's memoir and essay incubator programs, was launched in 2018 to bring together writers from inside and outside the Grub Street community to share first-person stories that make meaning from lived experience. Before we get started, just a quick note of thanks to our co-sponsors, Belmont Books, for hosting us tonight, and to Grub Street, Boston's only creative writing center, now operating in a beautiful new space in the seaport. You should check out the sunsets from that building. They're spectacular. The memoir and essay incubators are year-long intensive workshop-based programs helping students draft and revise their manuscripts and essays to be ready for publication. Applications for the memoir incubator are currently open. For those interested in finding out more about both programs, check out the link in the chat or visit grubstreet.org. Tonight's program features four writers and our very special guest, memoir incubator, is instructor Alicia Abbott. Um, but for now, I'm going to introduce to you our first reader, and that is Henri Wheeler. Henri is a writer, anti-racist educator, and mother of three strong daughters. She is a graduate of Grub Street's Memoir Incubator and is a newly appointed reviews editor at Pangyris Magazine. She is working on a memoir about race, class, and mermaids. Her, essay and book, her essays and book reviews have appeared in LitHub, The Boston Globe, Hippocampus, Romper, and many others. So welcome Henri to the stage. Thank you very much. I'm excited to be here tonight. This essay uh, is entitled Tears, Excavation, and Then the Zoom Ends. Our first couples therapy session almost became our last. We were halfway through when the terrible advice came. People don't change, but they can be compelled to change their behavior, our therapist began. She had the weathered skin of a white woman who has lived her hair two-toned, her eyes, at least over Zoom, small and dark. It was my first time in couples therapy, Dave's first time seeing a therapist of any kind. We were seeking help untangling the mounting tension between me and Dave's parents, 
to whom I've stopped speaking. But as with many things, it's never as straightforward as the problem that you think needs solving. You have something that they want, so you have all the power. Withhold access to their grandchildren. I've seen alcoholics of 40 years quit cold turkey when told they'd never see their grandkids again. Her matter of fact response, after hearing a brief overview of the in-law conflict, had shocked us. It's since been decried by many friends who are therapists. As much as I'd been hurt, I would never use my children as a prop. And if making people less patriarchal was achievable through the withholding of grandchildren, the world might look vastly different. We declined to book another session. Luckily, I had reached out to three therapists and shortly after the disastrous quick fix, my first choice all along wrote back. Dr. Patel was returning from maternity leave early because she could see patients virtually. We've never met her in person. She beamed into our bedroom once a week, framed by my rose gold laptop, its screen pert while I slouched on the bed next to Dave. I felt an instant kinship with her, not because Asian women are a monolith, but because of the many things I didn't have to explain. Just as my first calls when I need to talk are usually to my college girlfriends who've pulled me through my darkest times, experiences I don't wish for my daughters. We are Korean, Chinese, and Japanese American, respectively. We grew up in different circumstances, but feel the same pricks. Our text thread at the start of the pandemic was peppered with photos of our cooking, perfectly chewy butter mochi, beautifully braided hala, homemade kimchi. We commiserate about the in-laws in our lives, how to draw boundaries, how to preserve relationships with our loved ones while doing so. Dr. Patel helped me connect past and future, cycles. Watching her watch me while I stole glances at myself was soothing. Her measured voice, chapped lips, and the almost imperceptible nods she made encouraged me to cry freely through my revelations. I articulated how Dave's parents echo through him when he casually prioritizes his work over mine, when he is so practical as I feel each storm of emotions at its fullest. For better or worse, we are the model of what a relationship looks like for the girls. They will internalize the way you treat me and expect similar, especially if they partner with men. I let my own words sink in. It frightens me to think my fumbling through with Dave will be seen as any kind of template. Just like 12 years into parenting, my only expertise is in how much I don't know. With Dr. Patel, we pushed each other. We listened, sometimes holding hands. I processed the accumulation of slights I've been socialized to take, the ways Dave's needs have taken precedence over mine while I've stayed quiet, feeling the knots form in my stomach. Dave, who I love deeply, whose goodness is unequivocal. And then the Zoom would end. Dave went back to the pandemic office space he's carved out in one of our daughter's bedrooms. I stayed in our bedroom at the desk we moved up from the kitchen. My tears were barely dry when one of the girls on a break from virtual school poked her head in to ask me a question or bring me a can of grapefruit seltzer. I am repeating cycles. My mother waited until I was an adult to pull back a corner of the curtain and reveal how my white grandmother shunned her. It's complicated my innocent memories of the woman, almost two decades dead, who took me to see the Nutcracker and fed me Pepperidge, Pepperidge Farm cookies. My immigrant mother gave up a flourishing career and proximity to friends and family when she crossed an ocean to start a life with my father. I am her American dream, version 2.0, I too married a kind, tall white man from Connecticut and have in-laws who don't see me. I continue to explore the chasm formed of partnering with someone unable to know parts of who I am. 
Is this loss intrinsic to all couplings? Dave, what do you want from your relationship with your parents? I watched Dr. Patel's mouth as it formed these words. Dave didn't grow up in a house where feelings were shared or voices were raised. In mine, we yelled. Feelings exploded, pop, pop, pop. And the next morning, we'd wake up and move on. Dave and I both, in different ways, learned to avoid confronting and atoning for harm. Now, instead of swallowing, I take up space. I want my daughters to express their pit in their stomach feelings, to embrace healthy conflict and accountability. Why haven't you shared how you're feeling with your parents? Dr. Patel asked. I don't wanna speak for Henri. I don't wanna misrepresent her feelings. This is when it hit me. I am the prop. In Dave's parent-child dynamic that lacks the ability to express and disentangle feelings, I up the emotional Richter scale. Only to those who've never lived through a quake, even a small aftershock can feel like too much. The repair I seek to move forward requires a self-awareness, an acknowledgement of complicity in larger systems that my in-laws lack. But Dave is starting to get it. He cracked open conversations with his siblings he unearthed stories long buried that helped me see that I am not alone. He, at Dr. Patel's urging, pushed back on his parents' attempts to manage parts of his life, even though he is 42. I don't know how these threads will ultimately intertwine or when I might re-engage with my in-laws, but Dr. Patel and I shared hope in these developments. I'm getting better at ignoring how others perceive the balance within our marriage. What matters are the daily renegotiations Dave and I have undertaken. We are disrupting cycles. Our sessions with Dr. Patel, now on pause until we feel we need support again, reflected back to us how we continue to be drawn together as we were in our earliest days. We can trace more clearly the roots of each other's needs. For me, this is inextricably linked with the ever urgent need to model better. Our pasts live in both of us, but just as alive is the desire to forge healthier patterns so the parts of us that survive through our daughters will be different. Thank you. Wow, that was magnificent, Henri. Thank you so much. Now, for our next reader is Deborah Sosin. Deborah is a writer, editor, clinical social worker, and Grub Street instructor. She holds an MFA from Leslie University and an MSW from Smith uh, College School of Social Work. Her essays have appeared in the New York Times, Boston Globe Magazine, Cognoscenti, The Writer's Chronicle, the, mani uh, the Manifestation in Elsewhere. Her award-winning picture book is called Charlotte in the Quiet Place. She's working on an essay collection, Heartbeats and Other Seismic Matters. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you. Thank you, Lorena. And thanks to Belmont Books and Grub Street for hosting this event. My essay is called The Onesie in the Closet. I bought the blue and white onesie just before my friend Roxanne gave birth. He ended up having a girl. In those days, it was unthinkable to give blue clothes to a baby girl. I waited a year or so for someone in my circle of friends to have a boy, but no one did. By then I'd fallen in love with the onesie, a soft brushed cotton short sleeved outfit with a robin's egg blue top it had a white rounded collar and stretchy white cuffs and white calf length bottoms with tiny metal snaps dotted along the inseams and down the back. So I kept it for myself, for my future baby. I was 38, single, still hopeful. Dreams of motherhood rippled throughout my childhood. Brad Hart and I were engaged in first grade. All the girls chanted, Debbie and Brad sitting in a tree, K-I-S-S-I-N-G. First comes love, then comes marriage, then comes baby in the baby carriage. I never doubted my destiny. 
By sixth grade, my best friend and I shoved pillows under our shirts and rubbed our protruding bellies, imagining what a kick from the inside would feel like. Then as a teenager, I suffered from bedpost clinging monthly cramps, but I figured it was all for a good cause because I'd have children someday, three in fact. At the University of Michigan during the freewheeling 1970s, casual sex without condoms was the norm and everyone understood that the woman supplied the birth control, in my case, a diaphragm. Just before my 21st birthday, my period was late. I didn't think much of it until the swollen, tender breasts and morning nausea. Wyatt, I thought, that one night stand. Wyatt was a scruffy waiter at Bicycle Gyms where I waitressed. We often flirted while filling ketchup bottles after hours. He was lanky with shoulder length brown hair and a marked spitz like swimmer's body. He came home with me one night at the crucial moment I realized my diaphragm was in the bathroom. I hate to break the mood, I thought, and what are the chances? I called Wyatt and said I was going to have an abortion. He offered to pay for half, the customary arrangement then. The Planned Parenthood counselor explained my options. Are you sure this is the right decision? She asked. You can think it over. I haven't even declared a major, I thought. There's plenty of time to have a baby or three. The procedure was quick. Over the whirring of the vacuum suction, the doctor asked how I was doing. The nurse squeezed my hand. I threw up from the Demerol. Afterwards, a group of women relaxed in orange vinyl recliners, nibbling rich crackers and sipping apple juice. And that was that. I never forgot the abortion entirely, but it receded into the shadows of my life, leaving just a faint imprint of what might have been. I moved to Boston and over the next decade, I celebrated friends' weddings, attended their baby showers, greeted their children. When would it be my turn? Not long after I bought the onesie in my late thirties, I met Daniel. That he was a former Jeopardy champion seriously boosted his appeal but it was his status as a brass player that won me over. Trumpet, tuba, trombone. Just the word embouchure made me tingle. For six steamy months, I could say my boyfriend, and I was optimistic. But despite being my best kisser ever, Daniel was not my Mr. Right. Much as I wanted kids, I never really considered artificial insemination or adoption, mostly for financial reasons. As the window for pregnancy naturally closed, I kept dating, but nothing. I came to accept my spinster status, but every spring when I purged my closets, I spotted my onesie and I was reminded of my dream of motherhood. Sometimes I'd peek under the miniature plastic bag and touch the soft cotton. Sometimes I'd slide it down the rod quickly out of sight. Menopause punctuated the end of my fertility with a whimper, not the dramatic bang I'd expected after 40 years of PMS and cramps. No hot flashes or night sweats, no massive mood swings. My period simply stopped. <clears throat> Birthdays beg for reflection, decade changes especially so. On my 60th birthday, I thought, what have I accomplished? What will my legacy be? I envisioned returning to my 21-year-old self, the one at Planned Parenthood. I lean over and whisper to her, so Deb, guess what? This is it, your one and only pregnancy. It's not going to happen. True love, the three kids, the script. What do you wanna do? I'll never know how my younger self would have answered. If we could twist time, would I rewrite my story? the one I began crafting with Brad Hart way back in first grade. If I'd gone through with the pregnancy, my child would have been 38 by then. I wondered for the first time ever, was it a boy or a girl? What would my child have been like? Would I have been a good mother? Would I have grandchildren by now? These questions are unanswerable, of course, and pressing for closure yields suffering. 
I heard a quote from a Zen master who said the secret to happiness is complete unrestricted cooperation with the unavoidable. The unavoidable perhaps being what actually is the truth of our lives. Some weeks after that birthday reverie, Maura and Rob, my 30 something downstairs neighbors had a baby, Jackson. Then during my spring closet purge, I saw the onesie and I thought, what if, no, how can I? I'd met Jackson only once, but I fell in love with his eye popping grin and big goofy ears. I bought a yellow gift bag decorated with giraffes, some crisp white tissue paper and a card. At home, I laid out the onesie on my bed, carefully sniffed off the store labels, took a photo and washed it along with my other delegates. After 23 years in the closet, it deserved to be washed. On the card, I wrote, this onesie comes with a story. I shared my tale with Mara and Rob. I said, I hoped they liked it. I said, I hoped Jackson would fit into it by summertime. I said, I hope that when he outgrows it, they'll pass it on to another couple. Maybe that's my legacy, my onesie, a gift for the child I always wanted, the one I never knew. Thank you. And I have a picture of the onesie from the photo that I took. I can't see if you can see it, but. Thank you. Deborah, thank you so much. That was so beautiful. Wow. Thank you so much and for sharing the photo of the onesie. What a gift. Now, yeah. our next um, our next writer is um, Brittany Del Creta. And Brittany is a freelance writer who works um, whose work sits at the intersection of sports, gender, culture, and queerness. Their book, Hail Mary, The Rise and Fall of National Women's Football League, I love that name, by the way, called Glorious and Galvanizing by, by Oprah Daly and a Delight by Publishers Weekly, is out now from Bold Type Books. Brittany, welcome. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm all sick, so hopefully I sound hot and not terrible, but um this essay was actually submitted way back in 2015 um, and ended up being published at Refinery29. Um, and it is called My Boyfriend Gave Me Up for Lent. I gave you up for Lent. He takes a swig of his beer, a drag of his cigarette. He's naked and my eyes fall to his round belly, the thin trail of hair, his husky build. I think about how much I missed this soft, sturdy body. He says it matter of factly, like there's no further explanation needed. It's the verbal equivalent of a shrug. We're sitting in his room. It's sometime in the early morning hours when most of the world is asleep. Or maybe dawn is breaking and people are beginning to rise to head to work. I bend down and do a line of cocaine off the counter. My breasts swing forward, heavy. I inhale deeply and feel the familiar trickle down the back of my throat. You what? It's the first time we've spoken, let alone seen each other, in 40 days. Our biweekly meetups had stopped suddenly without warning. My texts went unanswered. I was sure I'd been ghosted. As a Jew, the possibility of Lent had never even crossed my mind. I sent an embarrassing number of drunk text messages and left an even more embarrassing number of incoherent voicemails. I got nothing in return. Then, seemingly out of the blue, his name appeared on my phone. It was 4 a.m. and the words were familiar. Hey, want to come over? Our relationship had never been particularly healthy. We met in a bar and bonded over cocaine, hard drinking, and rough sex. We'd go home together after the bar closed and stay up all night, talking, screwing, drinking, snorting, repeat ad nauseum. Aside from the partying, we didn't really have much in common. I'd been thrilled to cast my vote for Obama when he won his first term. He pouted when the results came in. He'd hoped for McCain. I dressed to stand out in a crowd, flaunting bright colors, loud patterns, and sky-high heels. He'd prefer to enter a room unnoticed, wearing t-shirts and jeans. I was a gossip, a loudmouth, a drama queen. He coveted privacy and discretion. Our relationship never really made sense to anyone that wasn't in it. Most of the time, it didn't even make sense to us. 
but in a haze of booze and cocaine, our differences seem to disappear. I can't be seen with you in public if you're gonna dress like that, I'm sorry. I looked at him in disbelief. Are you really breaking up with me because, because my clothes are too flashy? He was. He said I embarrassed him in front of his friends with the outfits I wore. I like girls in jeans and a tank, he reminded me. I felt like a child who'd been scolded by a parent. In an instant, I was two inches tall. Not good enough, never good enough. I said I would dress differently if he'd just changed his mind. I was desperate to hold on to him, but it didn't matter. His decision was final. That was that. He wasn't kidding when he said that he wouldn't be seen with me in public dressing the way I did. After we broke up, he hardly ever spoke to me in front of other people. Twice a week, we hung out in the same bar, the bar where we'd met. He stayed on one end with his friends. I sat at the bar talking to mine. I spent most of the night hoping that something would change, that he would walk over and say hi, sit down and have a drink, put his arm around me and smile. I'd try to make eye contact or find any excuse to try to talk to him. I laughed too loudly and flirted too aggressively. Instead, every night at closing time, my phone would light up. Hey, want to come over? I always went. This continued for over three years. Week after week, I'd go to his place in the dead of night. I'd leave other dates with very nice guys, men who were actually into me and who had no problem being seen with me in public, to sneak into his house under the cover of darkness, careful not to wake his roommates. I hoped he would wake up one morning and realize that he really wanted to be with me. I figured that having him like this was better than not having him at all. I took him in whatever way I could get him because when I was with him, all my doubts about myself melted away. It was proof that I was worthy of love. The thing about him that kept me holding out hope was that I knew he cared about me. He was the kind of guy who would rather not get laid than have to spend hours hanging out with someone he didn't like. The fact that we spent these nights together on a regular basis was evidence to me that he liked me and that maybe he even loved me in his own way. And so we'd drink, use, fuck, talk, and pass out. The afternoons we'd wake up and didn't, he didn't immediately kick me out were my favorites. We'd spoon into the early afternoon, limbs tangled together. He'd kiss my mouth, bring me coffee, turn on the game. Those days gave me hope. Let me keep thinking that maybe one day things would be different. Maybe one day this would all be real. The longer this went on, the more unstable I became. Aside from his roommates, very few people knew that we were still sleeping together regularly. To the rest of the world, I was just a pathetic girl who couldn't get over him. She's crazy, they'd say, loud enough for me to hear. I was the unhinged ex yelling, why don't you just go home with her already, across the bar as he chatted up another woman. I was the scorned lover who couldn't move on, who sent texts at all hours of the night begging to see him. I wore the bruises from our consensually rough encounters like badges of honor. I flaunted them as proof that we'd been together. He gave me this bruise two nights ago when we were having sex. See, it's not over, we're not over. He's mine, so back off. I was possessive of someone that I had no right to ownership over, as if there's ever someone it's okay to act like you own. But in my head, he was mine. And since he wasn't willing to tell the world that was the case, I felt compelled to do it for him. You generally don't give something up for Lent unless it's hard for you to do. The year before he decided to give me up, he'd stopped drinking soda for 40 days. I was the equivalent of soda. But we were each other's vices. We weren't necessarily good for each other, but we didn't know how to leave each other alone. I tried, I really did. I dated other people, but continued sleeping with him behind their backs. I'd leave dates to meet him when he beckoned me. Maybe this is the night it will be different. I told myself it was the sex that kept me going back, and that was part of it, sure. Our chemistry was electric, but the truth was that I needed the validation. I needed to feel worthy. I needed to hold on to him as proof that I was desirable, and when he called, I could finally exhale. When he called, I knew I was good enough. In those moments, in those hours, I was enough. And sometimes that's enough. That's it. Thank you. Wow. I love how provocative this piece is. Thank you so much, Brittany. Mm -hmm. So check out their book, Hail Mary, The Rise and Fall of the <coughs> National Women's Football League. And it is available for purchase at Belmont Books. Thank you again, Brittany.
Our next reader is Catherine O'Neill. Catherine graduated from Grub Street's Memoir Incubator Program in 2017. Her work has been published in the International Women's Writings Group's Title Magazine, Write Launch, Covey Club, Write Angle, and the Irish Central Newspaper. Her memoir in progress is called Zero Balance, A Journey into the Disease of Gambling. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you, Lorena. Um, my essay I'm gonna read is called A Mother's Love. Um, I grew up in Ireland, an island heavily salted with saints and likely peppered with scholars incapable of teaching sex ed. As an immigrant and a single parent, I found myself shadow shadowing my fifth grade son after I had signed off giving him permission to attend the talk with the school nurse and principal. I myself had felt cheated at his age when I looked up the word sex on page 82 of my first dictionary and was referred to page 19 for copulation, only to be further pissed when redirected to the sex definition. A residual angst rumbled about my botched sex ed. I was determined history wouldn't repeat itself. Most of my flat-chested prepubescence was spent trying to play soccer with the boys. There were no teams for girls in my hometown. I was a tomboy, and my mother's hard push to have me wear Flintstone's training bra ended in rebellion. I figured putting Fred and Wilma on each boob would only draw giggles from my peers who flaunted their cleavage with the boys. As a late bloomer, the birds and bees flew, talk flew over my head. As a mother, my role was to save my son from prepubescent embarrassment. I knew our childhoods would never be the same. I now regret not reading that stupid book, Girls Growing Up, my mother gave me that I flung under the mattress. That's the joy of growing up in Ireland. The schools like to think the parents are covering sex ed and the parents like to assume it's the school's job. I wasn't about to let my son be left behind with that malarkey. Truth is, my son and I are emotional beings who blew through pu prepubescence like it was one big bout of flatulent anxiety. I was already a troubled 14 year old older than my son when the science teacher ambushed me in my girls, all girls class. What is menstruation, she asked, circling my bench and giving off a hint of cheap cologne. I'm afraid I don't know. I answered, hoping she'd move on. But she zoomed in with the merry glee of an alien abduction ship. She repeated the question and still, I didn't know the answer for a second and third time. I'd hope she'd take a polite hint. Say the word slowly. She urged me to break down the syllables. Menstruation. Does it have anything to do with men, I said. You're hilarious, she said. The class laughed hard. I sat frozen, focusing on the big hand of the clock above the blackboard, wanting to erase time. The talk day finally rolled around and I bounced out of bed early and made my son's favorite pancakes for breakfast. When he returned home, he bypassed me and went to his bedroom and picked up his guitar, strumming and singing a Green Day song. I anxiously called him down for a burger dinner a few hours later. So, uh, so how was your day, I asked. Okay, you know, the usual, he said, applying his ketchup to his burger with an artistic flourish. Well, I meant how was the talk? Okay, the girls sat on one side of the class and the boys sat on the other side. The school nurse and Mr. C, the principal, sat at the blackboard, he said. Hmm. So did you have any questions, I asked? No. 
I think I'm good, he said, and traced tracks of ketchup with mustard. Good. So everything was cool on the playground, then I asked? Not really. The girls didn't want to play football anymore. Awkward, you know what I mean? The boys went to one side of the playground and the girls went to the other side. And the boys kept giggling every time Mr. C said the A word. One kid almost got a detention for laughing so hard. The A word? I puzzled my mind through all the A words remotely related to sex, re reawakening the mortification, menstruation. Yeah, you know the A word. He took a large bite of his burger. I wondered if he was too young to hear the talk. My experience had taught me sex ed has a way of sending Cupid running for the hills and taking innocence hostage. Well, I think I know what the A word is. Did Mr. C write the word on the blackboard? Nope, he just said it, he answered. Hmm, tell me what your A word is and I'll tell you if it's the same as mine. Ejaculation, he answered, making a doodle of ketchup and mustard. I choked a silent laugh. Mr. C should have written it on the board and saved me sweating it out. Mine is the same, except I think it might begin with an E, I said. For weeks, I doubted if either of us was ready for sex aid, Ed. Is anyone? My fear followed me through my son's middle school years. In time, I questioned my angst about sex ed and the humiliation it sparked. I wanted to cry that day in science class, but couldn't because sissies cried. When I finally grew boobs, I spent my accelerated adolescence stealing cigarettes, sipping on cider, and strutting my stuff at the disco. I didn't want the same path for my son. That worry fell away when he smiled up with his girly rock star haircut and broke down the syllables of ejaculation. I was uplifted to the funny side of sex ed being for lame birds and blooper bees. His response opened up a new silence and about how fear had traveled with me into parenthood. The sex ed mem memory was merely coincidental. I know now that it was the fear-based humiliation I had carried long distance. Fear has to be one of the most disintegrating of all human emotions for any parent. I see how I tried to scoop up my son's emotion in a shell-proof armor thinking I could save him when all I was really doing was sheltering him and preventing him from experiencing the courage to be himself. I had learned the worst form of parenting is to overparent. When I retired as a helicopter parent, my son became a high school football captain and would later leave for college with a wide grin under a full beard. He's since graduated and doing okay without any emotional parachutes for me. Today, we can both giggle aloud about our talk. I just, I love the humor in this piece. That is really wonderful, Catherine. Thank you so much. Thank you. So finally tonight, we're going to hear from Alicia Abbott. Yay, Alicia! So Alicia is the author of the internationally award-winning memoir, Fairyland. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, the Boston Globe, The Guardian, Vogue, Lit Hub, and elsewhere. She's a graduate of the New School MFA writing program and currently runs Grub Street's memoir incubator. And I can't say enough wonderful things about Alicia as an instructor. So if you're looking for um, to sign up for the memoir incubator, I highly recommend um, you do so now. So welcome, Alicia. Thank you so much, uh, Lorena. And I also want to thank all the readers who joined tonight. It's such an honor to read 
amongst you, some of you I've worked with as students, and, and also um, for all of you writers joining from home, I hope you'll consider submitting for the next tell-all, um, because it's really just a great way to, you know, to share, to get on stage and to, to share this really great space. So uh, I'm going to be reading an essay that was rejected by Modern Love, but I wrote um, about 10 years ago, or a little over 10 years ago. Um, it is called A Valentine for Finney. When my daughter was five years old, my husband and I stopped showing up in the many drawings and cards she brought from home from school. Instead, Annabelle made nearly every creation for him, her baby, her cutie boy, her brother, Finn, a map to Candyland for Annabelle and Finney, a magnet for Finney, a valentine for Finney. Whenever she drew herself in a picture, he was there, always small, sometimes crying, and whenever her name appeared, just below she wrote his. When we moved to a bigger home later that year, Annabelle worried about Finn getting his own room for the first time. What if he gets scared, she asked. Who will sing to him? After all, she said, I won't be there and only I speak his language. But what was Finn's language, I asked myself. At almost four, I expected he'd be speaking in sentences, enjoying Dr. Seuss saying mama or at least answering to his name. Instead, he still pointed and grunted, clicked and made kissy sounds, having lost even the rudimentary babbling he was capable of two years before his diagnosis. Growing up an only child, siblings fascinated me. I loved to look for similarities between family members I spied on buses, and I envied the teasing between my friends and their brothers and sisters. I was determined to give Annabelle someone who'd share her memories and listen to her late night stories. I never considered that something could go wrong. Finn was born two weeks late, but otherwise healthy. Normal APGAR scores, we were out of the hospital within 48 hours. But at eight weeks, Finn still couldn't lift his head. He didn't smile or respond to loving gazes from me or my husband, Jeff. We nicknamed him Old Stony Face. Then at the three month wellness visit, a shadow passed over the face of our pediatrician. She sent us to a neurologist who ordered our first MRI launching us into an odyssey of doctor visits and procedures that I desperately hoped would answer the question, what is afflicting this boy? Finally, when Finn was 15 months old, our third neurologist at our third hospital waved his hand as though he were holding a wand. Your diagnostic pursuit is over, he said. Your son has autism spectrum disorder. We enrolled Finn in 35 hours a week of speech, occupational and physical therapy. All the while, I looked for improvements and changes. But I was the changed one. With Annabelle, I'd been a can-do kind of mom. But whenever I met Finn's doctors, everything slowed. In these cheery offices with their Sesame Street wall stickers, at agencies with names like Building Blocks and Guidance Center, I knew I was supposed to be actively listening, asking questions, thinking about Finn and how to help him. But my head felt as though it'd been filled with cotton. How did I get here, I wondered. How did this life become my life? It happened so fast. Couldn't we go back to before? Jeff and I despaired over Finn, but in those early months, I worried as much about Annabelle. We'd still need to find her playmates. She'd still suffer the loneliness that I knew growing up. She'd have to care for us alone in her adult years, but would now also have to care for her disabled brother. For a while, I longed powerfully for a new baby. I wanted to give her the sibling that would hit all the milestones. But I pushed away these thoughts. A new baby would only add to our already considerable load. Besides, the concerns that plagued me never seemed to bother Annabelle. He'll talk when he's a teenager, she said to me confidently one day. He may not. When he's a grown up, he'll talk. We don't know if that will happen. Then how will he have kids? Not everyone has kids. Not everyone gets married. I'll marry Finney. Annabelle's boundless love fascinated me because in truth, Finn was not always easy to like then. 
Often I discover a favorite book ripped to shreds, then have to fish a piece of the cover from his still chewing mouth. We don't eat books, I repeated emphatically, but Finn never understood. He, he would never meet my eyes. When he screamed in hunger, I tried vainly to quiet him. I'm making you food. Can't you see I'm, I'm making it? I have to boil the pasta. I turn my back for a minute and then find him gnawing on the sole of my boot, my boot or playing in the toilet water. When I took away the ripped book, removed the boot, closed the toilet seat, the crying would come. A cry so shrill and relentless, it felt like someone was hitting me in the head with a two by four. I can't do this, I whispered to myself after one such episode. He needs so much, I can't, I can't do this. Annabelle heard my quiet venting. He's just a baby, she said. Don't be angry at him. I was dumbfounded and ashamed. How could this five-year-old be so generous, so patient? As the mother, wasn't I supposed to love him most of all? And as the sister, wasn't she supposed to be jealous of all the attention he gets? Shouldn't she try to push him over, steal the last cookie off his plate? She never did. Then there were the times when Finn would come to me for comfort. Without looking at my face, he'd soundlessly fall into my lap. I'd rock him, and when he offered me his open, tender palms, I'd stroke them lightly with my index fingers. His breathing slowed, his muscles slackened. He almost purred, and I felt flush with love for this child. But it was different between him and Annabelle. He never tried to hug her then. When she grabbed him, he pushed her or turned away. He hit, he bit. I don't get it, Annabelle, I said one day. Why do you love him so much? I just do, she answered. Then I realized Annabelle couldn't remember a time before Finn. She got to know him without any notion of what a so-called normal brother would be. She was never burdened with the longing that felled my husband and me. She never hoped, like I did in those days, that a medical intervention, getting his eyes straightened or tubes put in his ears, might allow Finn to look at us and answer to his name. She never believed that modern medicine would give us the boy I thought we were supposed to have, the real boy. I can't say that Annabelle's love for Finn remained this uncomplicated. As she's aged, she sometimes felt self-conscious about his behavior the way he'd run behind the counter at the market and I had to leave her by the cart while I chased him, or the time he tried to attack when I was driving her and a friend back from ballet. But in that moment, that five-year-old became my teacher. Annabelle helped me focus on loving Finn, not for who he was supposed to be, but for who he is. And like her, I found and now continue to find joy in his joy, the way he smiles when he jumps on the bed or splashes in the tub or hangs his head upside down from the sofa. A smile so brilliant and so true that at moments it bursts my heart. Thank you. That is just so beautiful, Alicia. Thank you so much. I think as a mother, I can't help but get choked up listening to how big Annabelle's heart is. Thank you very much. Um, well, that wraps it up with all of our uh, writers. So thank you to all our readers, to Belmont Books, to Grub Street, and to all our Tell All volunteers, Amy Seife Christian, Rachel Zimmerman, Judy McClure, Michael Sinnert, and Doug Smith. So what I would like to do next is actually ask a question of all of our readers tonight. And um, so, you know, all of the essays that, that we featured tonight were rejected by modern love, as everybody knows, and that's why we're here listening to you. But we're wondering, how do each of you manage rejection in your own life? So, you know, as writers, we submit all the time and you got to have pretty thick skin to get the many no's that you get. So how does each one of you deal with that? So why don't we start with Henri, since you were the first one? Um, sure. So... I, I will be honest and say it really depends on what kind of a day I'm having when that email uh, comes in. But I think uh, on my better days, I, I really do try to see a rejection as an invitation to uh, continue to either resubmit as is to make changes and, and continue to try to put that piece uh, out there. And, and also sometimes 
you're not ready for that. Like it's just, you're not ready to hear that feedback. And so sometimes you need to just put it aside and wait days or weeks or months. But really what I try to tell myself is that what that rejection means is not that I am a bad writer or that that piece is a bad piece of writing. It means that they just accepted another essay on tree frogs or that that residency just went to, you know, someone else who writes about mermaids. And, and it's not any, any sort of indictment on my own writing. Uh, and so to just keep going. That's excellent. That's very, very powerful. Thank you, Henri. What about you, Deborah? Well, I, I uh, have similar thoughts to Henri. I, I have taken a stance of the success for me is in the submitting. Like if I can get myself to submit, then that's like my victory. And so I have little things all over my desk. And one is just, if you don't submit, you can't get published. It's kind of like a little mantra. So that, that sometimes takes a lot of effort. And, and I, I think I've, there's certain things I do get attached to in terms of wanting to have a specific essay appear in a specific publication like Modern Love. That would have been nice, but I had to kind of console myself that I, I did get a personal note back from Dan Jones. So that was like, okay, now that's some badge of honor. Um, it took, if for people who want it, this was years ago, but it took three months. So, but it was really, really nice of him to write me personally. And that kind of thing, once I had a piece rejected by the um, Boston Globe coupling column, and it used to be coupling because they had just, it wasn't tree frogs, but it was, it was a similar topic to what I was writing about. And that was disappointing. But um, a year and a half later, I thought about that essay again and I, I queried the editor and she said, you know, I said, has it been enough time to, to print this? And she goes, yeah, great. Yeah, for next week, give me 50 more words and get it to me by tonight, we can do it. And I said, great. So you never know if you, um, but yeah, I mean, it's just part of, part of the writing life. I love that perseverance. And I like your little mantra. That's really cool. Thank you. <laughs> what about you, Brittany? Yeah, so I'm a full-time freelancer. So I get rejected like multiple times a week. <laughs> um, I'm incredibly used to it now. And I, you know, to not repeat stuff that other people have said, because I think reframing it as a success and getting one step closer to like finding it, um, it's it's the home it's meant to have is, is a really big part of that for me. Um, I always try to have at least three publications in mind when I submit. So I know exactly where I can send it back out um, right away. So I feel like I have an action step um, that I can take. But I have found that even just submitting, um, I've developed relationships with editors to the point that I get assignments and people reach out to me, even if they've never commissioned me because they remembered my work. I have an editor that's rejected me like once a month for three years now. She's never commissioned me, but she's gotten me two other assignments with other editors based on like my clips. And when I didn't pitch her for a while, she was like, oh, hi, Brittany. It's nice to hear from you again. And she still never accepted anything from me, um, but I've still gotten work just based on that. So I also think the other thing I try to remember is that rejection actually I think will make you better at selling your work and like writing um, because it will help you hone and like sharpen and, and tighten what you're doing. Um, I love talking about this. I teach at Grub Street also. And if you ever take a class with me, you will leave with a full page handout about why rejection is really great. Um, so <laughs> I will stop now and let other people answer, but I think it's a great question and I'm glad it was, it was posed to us. That's really awesome because it's true, right? You have to kind of like look at, at the positives of a negative, you know, what comes because it can't all be negative, right? We can't focus on that. That's great. Thanks, Brittany. Catherine, can you tell us about your experience with rejection? How do you handle it? Um, well, for me, uh, rejection and kind of piggybacks what uh, some of the other uh, readers have, have already said, and it's really just that gateway to revision which can be a healthy exercise. Um, you know, I think, uh, I guess I'm more concerned about, you know, hitting the send button, you know, for is, 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 uh, isn't always easy for me. Um, so I do, but when I do have a rejection, uh, you know, in the case of this story, you know, I kind of go into it almost like a 
drowning experience when I see how many people are rejected from modern love. And that, in this case, I kind of knew I, you know, I had a snowball's chance in hell, but you know, I was going to hit the send button anyway, which is, which is, um, which I'm very proud of myself for hitting the send button. Um, but you know, rejection's never easy. But you know, and it's as you get older, it does become a little bit easier. And and you know, one way I look at it is almost like you know, I. I, um, you know, I kind of relax into it like it's some kind of drowning experience or something. And, um, you know, it's also like a time to, you know, slice and dice things. In the case of this essay, um, I did chop, slice and dice it and it was partially published with right angles. So, you know, um, just to finalize it, I suppose, re rejection is never easy, but, you know, there's the rebound and it's can be a you know sometimes be a better uh, rebound than you can ever anticipate. Nice. Well, I like your angle of using that as an editing kind of opportunity and not giving up on your article. Just you know, edit it and submit it somewhere else. I really like that. Thank you so much. And finally, Alicia, tell us about your experiences. Um, well, that it's been so great to listen to everyone else um, describe. I love that idea, Catherine, of like trying to relax into it so it's like so you don't drown like you're not trying to like splash and then drown yourself um because i think that you know rejection can have that effect like it is it can feel emotional especially i think when you're a nonfiction writer and the pieces you're you're sending are so personal sometimes we spend so much time on them but it's it's funny because just the the topic for tonight's event like modern love you know celebrating modern love rejects like so many people have sent in essays to modern love like i'm hoping we do this event next year but you know modern love is is sort of like the sexy jerk that everyone wants to date you know and then so everyone goes for it and it's but it's kind of like well you know but is that even the right place for me is that the right place for this like just because everyone wants to publish there and i think that like with dating sometimes your piece you know, the place it's rejected by, maybe it's not the best fit. And maybe you find another fit, you know, by someone else will appreciate it more. Or, you know, sometimes you learn a lot through the rejection process. I like to, you know, I, I feel like this is a, a question that I love hearing how different people answer because like um, Grace Toulousan, who is a, a writer in the Boston community, who has you know, recently was uh, received an NEA grant and, you know, won the um, the Restless Prize Award for their book, The Body Papers, for her book, The Body Papers, will say, well, you know, they've got to take somebody, so you might as well apply. Um, and Jonathan Escoffery, who is uh, another writer from the Grub community, would say he would just have so many pieces out at once that he couldn't keep track to, to be like, oh, yeah, that place rejected me. Okay, well, I've got all these other pieces out, too. So, I think sometimes just recognizing that rejection is the cost, it's like the tax you pay for putting yourself out there. And like what, um, you know, Deborah said, you can't, uh, you know, you can't get accepted unless you prepare to be rejected. The important thing is to realize that it may not be personal. So yeah, thank you though. Thank you everyone for, for reading tonight. Thank you so much. Yeah, I agree. You've just got to put yourself out there. It's part of the game, right? You got to pay to play, as they say. Um, so I think our time is up. I'm going to hand it over back to Amanda. Thank you all so much for coming. This has been an amazing experience. And thank you for inviting me to be host tonight. You are great. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lorena. Thank you to all of the writers. Thank you for the, the warm and engaging and enthusiastic chat tonight. This was so great. Um, as a reminder, Brittany has a book out, Hail Mary. It is on our shelves currently. Um, if you'd like to order a copy, I put a link in the chat where you can grab it. Um, you can come into the store. We can do curbside pickup. We also ship throughout the continental US um, if you are interested. And if you came in halfway through or you had to stop and get something to eat or you missed anything or just want to revisit these essays again, we have recorded the event. It should be up on our YouTube within, I would say 48 hours or so. Um, but I will send a thank you email to everyone who attended with a reminder and a link to our YouTube channel so you can check it when it's up. Um, and once again, thank you to Grub Street and thank you to these amazing writers. And thank you, Lorena, for, for hosting tonight. It was a pleasure.
everyone have a great evening.